All right. It's uh, Friday, February 9th, 2024. I'm Megan Muir interviewing David Gwynn for the Pride of the Community Project. Um, thanks for talking with us. Sure. Thanks. Oh, and my pronouns are she, her. Uh, he, him for me. Okay. Um, could you start by telling us a little bit about your background? I know that there's another interview, but just for this one. Like yeah, I mean, yeah, basically I was born in uh, Greensboro and about nine months after John F. Kennedy was assassinated, which really doesn't have anything to do with anything, but <laughs> you know, it does mean that I was born at a time when there was a Republican from Texas as president, which is probably something that's never, or I'm sorry, a Democrat from Texas as president, which is probably something that's never gonna happen again. But um, I was born here. I went to school in Greensboro uh, for a large part of my elementary school years. I was at a very conservative Southern Baptist Christian school, which is odd because my parents were not particularly religious. Uh, over the years, I've had to yeah, deal with the fact that it probably was sort of a white flight thing because of busing at that point. Not necessarily white flight, but more my parents were concerned about the school I was going to be bused to. So I was at the school. Um, I didn't, my parents, as I said, were not terribly religious, so I didn't fall hook, line, and sinker for everything that was indoctrinated <laughs> into me there. I was sort of devoutly religious there for a little while around the fourth or fifth grade. But around the seventh or eighth grade, I started saying, you know, this is sort of inconsistent and hypocritical. So interestingly enough, going to this religious school had the uh, the effect of ultimately turning me into an atheist, but go figure. Uh, that was probably not what they were going for at the time, but that was the end result. Um, I transferred into, uh, into the Greensboro Public Schools when I was in junior high. Um, junior high was unpleasant, but junior high is unpleasant for everybody. Um, I was not a very social kid. I didn't do sports at all. No sports. Don't like them. Never have. If it has a ball, I don't care. Um, but, uh, and that was problematic. You know, I didn't have a lot of friends in junior high school. I was not very, I was very socially awkward and didn't, didn't play well with others. Um, you know, I got ribbed a little bit, but people didn't mess with me a whole lot because I was big. I couldn't fight my way out of a paper bag if I tried, but people didn't know that and they weren't willing to risk finding out. So, you know, they would murmur, eh, fag, 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 which I don't think meant anything to anybody at that point having to do with sexual orientation. It's just mm -hmm. what teenagers call each other in those days. And still, unfortunately. Um, then high school was a little different. I decided, okay, well, I'm not gonna be a bad boy anymore. I'm gonna, or I'm not gonna be, um, a hermit anymore. I'm going to become a bad boy uh, and make friends. So, you know, I started smoking, I started drinking, I started playing around with, with, with the drugs here and there. That only lasted for about a year. Well, the smoking and the drinking lasted longer than that, but the drugs only lasted for about a year. Um, then my junior year in high school, I went back into hermit mode. Uh, my senior year was good, though, because I met with kind of a, a more interesting crowd at that point. And, um, you know, I actually, that was one, that was sort of my coming out period to personally, not publicly. Um, you know, I started reading up a lot of reading a lot of literature, etc., and started experimenting around in the ways that were available to a 17-year-old in North Carolina at that point. And you know, that was that was a year I sort of defined myself a little better than I had in earlier years. And you know, at that point, I came to college, but I think we get to that later, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I mean, that is, the next question is about when you intended UNCG. Well, that was easy. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I graduated uh, from high school in 1982, and at that point, I had actually come out to several of my, f a couple of my close friends at that point. Uh, that summer between high school and college was the big coming out point, if you will, and was also the point where I got introduced to UNCG. I was actually here on campus before I was a student because I was working at the uh, campus radio station. Um, you could at that time work at the radio station if you were about to be a student the following semester. Um, so I was here from then on and you know, it was 
it was great. It was a whole different world for me. I, you know, for the first time in my life, I was around people I actually liked um, that were, you know. I thought I was a weird kid, and you know, um, I've, weird kids fit in better in college usually than they do in high school. It sort of comes with the territory. So um, I was at UNCG for the first time from 1982 to 1984 as an undergraduate. For a, vi a variety of reasons, I uh, dropped out <laughs> at the uh, sort of on the cusp between being a sophomore and a junior, so basically after two years. Um, then worked, uh, lived in Charlotte for a while. Came back in 1989 and finished my undergraduate degree in uh, fall of 1991, um, at which point I moved to San Francisco. That's another part of chronology we'll do later. <laughs> then moved back here um, in 2005. I ended up going to grad school, so I had a third time at UNC Greensboro when I got my master's degree in library and information science now, studies at the time, um, and then ultimately came to work here. And I've been, so I've pretty much been pretty consistently on campus now for the last 16 and a half years so okay. um, well, sorry it took longer to answer that question than it usually does with, some, with somebody's college experience but <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you were a new student so I guess maybe the first time at UNCG mm -hmm. how do you find other LGBTQ people with great difficulty okay. uh, I, uh, I didn't for a long time. You know, I, didn't, I didn't know a lot of gay people at all early on. I had a lot of friends who I liked really well. Most of them were straight. And you know, ultimately, over the course of my life, I've had generally a pretty high proportion of straight friends compared to a lot of other gay people. But um, I did start meeting people at that point. How, how do I put this delicately? Not so much on a social level, but um, mean people in sexual liaisons. Yeah, that's a good diplomatic way to put it. Um, in a variety of ways that you know, are not necessarily socially acceptable at this point in time, but there were there were they were what people did in those days. Um, you know, the first time I actually had a sexual experience was actually in an adult bookstore on High Point Road when I was 16. How I got into an adult bookstore when I was 16 <laughs> is a whole different story. But remember, I was big. I looked old. I could also buy beer at a very young age, which was another problem. Um, and UNCG had a reputation as a school where there were a lot of gay people. Um, many of them out, many of them not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was, yeah, on the UNCG campus, there was the whole big, what, what is referred to as the tea room scene. Um, after a, um, it's a book called Law at Humphreys called Tea Room Trade. And it was a thing that in the closeted days when you could get arrested for actually meeting and having sex with somebody, people, men would meet in public restrooms. Uh. Um either do their business there or meet up and go to other places. That went on at UNCG. UNCG had some notorious cruising spots at the time. More than one of them here in the library. <laughs> um, and also in Elliott Center and some other buildings on campus. So uh, they were featured in various magazines and later even in websites over the years. It was done. And it was a, it was a fairly common thing on college campuses there. And yeah, there were a lot of people, you'd meet people that way. I then was sort of peripheral. I was very much involved with the radio station and student government when I came in. And I came to meet a lot of people that way, too, more, on more of a social level. Okay. Uh, that took some time, though, um, you know, for uh, the, gay, uh, the Gay and Lesbian Student Association, which is what it was called at that point uh, in, I don't know, 1982, 1983. I was actually not really a member of. I didn't, I didn't, I was not a joiner um, well, on that level at that point. But I was involved with uh, the Senate, uh, the Student Government Association funding that organization for the first time um, as a member of Senate and on the Appropriations Committee. And I actually met, uh, yeah, I started meeting more gay people at that point. Um, Actually, the chair of the committee I was on at that time was John Neal, who later went on to own White Rabbit Books here in Greensboro, which was an LGBTQ bookstore. Um, so got to know him. Um, I 
And when I at that point in North Carolina, you could drink at age eighteen. Okay. You could go to bars at eighteen, beer and wine at eighteen, liquor at twenty one. Because I don't know, you don't get us <laughs> drunk off beer and wine. I don't know what the deal was with that. But um, I didn't actually go to a gay bar until I was nineteen or more because I didn't. I was sort of intimidated by it to begin with. Um, you know, I was sort of introverted. I was not much of a drinker at that point. I had been a drinker earlier. I was a lot of a drinker later, but in that particular wedge of time, I didn't drink very much. Um, and I, I didn't really feel comfortable with it. In fact, the first time I actually went to gay bars was when I had met uh, people through other circumstances and was sort of dating and hanging out, and we went together. Mm. Yeah, I remember the first, <laughs> I think the first gay bar I ever walked into was this weird little dump in Greensboro called the Revol which was lover spelled backwards. It was the creepiest place I've ever been. We walked in, there was nothing there, but the, there was nobody there, but the owner and his boyfriend was creepy and quiet and dark. And we walked in and went to the bathroom and walked right back out and said, uh-uh, <laughs> none of this. Uh, the, first one, the first one I ever walked into, into and stayed was the Palms in Greensboro, okay. uh, which was actually a lesbian owned bar, but. A, had a mixed crowd, and then you know Encore, which was the big one size fits all. I'll talk a little more about gay bars in a minute, but okay. um, that was that was the way I started meeting people at UNCG in those years. So, I mean, yeah, you know, through less respectable circumstances, more respectable circumstances. Um, you know, I became maybe not even appropriately, but became known as sort of an having sort of an activist bent at that point and you know I did all the right thing I took John D'Amelio's history of sexuality sexuality class when he was here he went on to become president of the National uh, Gay and Lesbian Task Force and mm. write several books etc we have an interview with him well you touched a little bit about the Greensboro Senate is that what it was uh, the student government the student Senate. government Senate mm -hmm. um, Hold on, let me find my question. Um, was that like, well, the question I'm trying to ask is uh, what were places that allowed for like community, community formation and organization? Um, so I guess I'll ask that. Okay, <laughs> that, I'm good with that question. It sort of depends on how you define community. I've always had a weird and some point some people would be annoyed by a definition of community I I kind of reject the uh, the notion of sort of an overriding gay community mm -hmm. because you know we're not a monolith we all we're all different um, I actually I use the word gay because it's a good shorthand word but I don't even particularly like the word gay because I think it implies membership in a community and a culture that I don't 100 I'm not 100 percent on board with I almost feels like kind of a marketing term to me or it did over time but um you know if you're talking about community as in a group of friends yeah that was more initially it was bars which frankly is not the most healthy way to develop that kind of circle of friends and actually impacted me I would say to some extent negatively in my view of the community in those days because we'll talk about I, I'll, I'll get on a whole chapter about bars later but um but you know I, um as far as building community there uncg did have the gay and lesbian student association i was not really comfortable being part of that because i was sort of intimidated by the group i went to a meeting once and i said i don't really feel comfortable in this group of people and i couldn't put my finger on why exactly um but it was weird walking into it. You know, I was, I knew a lot of gay people. I was comfortable around it. This, were, this was a different group. And I don't know, it was weird. And I think you know, it may have been the blossoming of my whole thing about identity politics. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't really get involved very much with, with that organization early on, though it was a thing that was available here. There were not a whole lot of bigger organizations in the early 80s. Later in the 80s, particularly uh, when HIV and AIDS became an issue, there became a larger number of community groups mm -hmm. that one could be involved with. I wasn't involved with a lot of them, but, but they were there. Okay. Is that sort of where you're going with, yeah, with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
really answered that question. Um, I guess my next question is uh, talking about what the what gay bars were like and how they might have changed in the different Ooh. times you were in D Greensboro. All right, this is the one <laughs> I was waiting for. Uh, I have a lot of um, very much a love hate relationship with gay bars. I, I find researching them incredibly interesting in their history. Uh, when I lived in San Francisco, I did a very early website that was kind of the spatial history of bars south of market in San Francisco. It was actually a very popular website at the time, and I pulled it down because things about it got irritating, but that's a different story. Um, but uh, but you know, researching gay bars and gay spaces over time was very interesting to me, particularly because when I was first coming out, a lot of what I read, a lot of the literature that was available was from the early gay liberation movement from the early 70s. Uh, it was very focused around free love, <laughs> lots of bars and, and sex clubs, that kind of thing. I found the whole subject fascinating in theory and in historical perspective. In practice, particularly here in North Carolina and in the South, I hated gay bars. I absolutely hated them. I went to them a lot. I spent a lot of time in them because that's where you would go to meet people. You know, you're going to meet the man of your dreams and have a drunken romp in the sack with him and never see him again. Um, which, even that didn't happen much for me. And that that's part of, I think, the issue I had with gay bars. You know, it's like they have a historical and I think a romanticized reputation as really safe spaces for gay people. And many of them were. Most of them, I would argue, maybe not so much because mm -hmm. to start with, you know, you're you're basing your whole social scene around alcohol, yeah. which is not a good starting point uh, for a lot of people. It's not a bad starting point for a lot of people either. I mean, the, uh, it does tend to loosen you up and make you less inhibit inhibited, meaning your friends. But for populations that have gone through a lot of pain over time substance abuse becomes a thing and I've watched a lot of my friends who were you know, bar flies from 40 years ago who are still bar flies and basically haven't done a thing with their lives since and it's kind of sad to watch that because uh, you think you know if they had a better outlet maybe things would have been a little different maybe they wouldn't have who knows but I also found that bars were not safe spaces for they were just as I don't know, clicky and uh, conformist as any other kind of society at the time. Um, bars were not safe spaces a lot of the time back then if you were a person of color, mm -hmm. if you were a woman, if you didn't have the right body type or the right fashion sense or the right look. Uh, I felt, I usually felt really invisible in gay bars in the South because I wasn't you know, I wasn't doing the fashion thing. I did not have that perfect sculpted swimmer's body. Um, I wasn't as fat as I am now, but you know, I think ultimately I looked okay. But I felt inv invisible because I didn't fit the mold of what you were supposed to look like and act like in a gay bar. Um, I didn't like to dance. I didn't like the music. I was... I was a, an indie rock kind of guy. I was not a techno dance kind of guy. That was not my thing. Um, you know, I, I didn't do, except for a brief, brief flirtation that involved a lot of weird hair in the mid 1980s. I wasn't really into the into the fashion thing either. I, you know, I later would tend to skew more indie and goth, mm. if you will, than gay. Uh, <laughs> and circuit mesh tank top look, which was not what everybody was. I think part of that was a problem for me, though, because it gave me sort of a negative impression on the community. And, yeah, it's like when, and that's what I say, when bars are your only introduction, mm -hmm. you think, oh, God, they all like this. Do I really want to be one of these people? Um, it was later after I left, to be honest, after, I, you know, I met people. I, I ultimately met more interesting people obviously outside bars because you know i would also go to see bands i would go to i didn't limit myself just to gay establishments mm -hmm. or gay movies or gay books 
which a lot of people think he's not gay enough for us and yet African Americans have that too it's like oh you're too white mm-hmm. you know it's sort of a sort of a thing that happens if you don't fit the mold of what you're supposed to look like um, it was later in North Carolina like the second time I was here after I lived in Charlotte for a while and met a really interesting crew of people there interesting I liked most of them but uh, that was when I started hanging out with sort of a really weird crowd um, but and when I moved to San Francisco and you know met a bigger critical mass of people that weren't so into the whole bar culture bar mm-hmm. scene thing that I actually not only felt a little more comfortable around my own people but also found bars that I like to go to and that I would actually go to by choice because they play really good music and I could get picked up there. Did I say that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> or you know, at least I didn't feel invisible there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, love-hate relationship. Uh, I don't go to bars at all anymore now. I mean, it's been... I've probably been in a gay bar like three times in the past 20 years because... Okay. I, uh, I mean, being back in North Carolina, particularly, I when I walk into a bar now, I'm like, oh god, this is awful. <laughs> Aside from the fact that everybody there's 22, um, the music's awful, the drinks are expensive, the beer used to be miserable, and I'm a little bit of a beer snob. I wrote a book on beer, okay, uh, <laughs> or <laughs> co-authored a book on beer. Um, the beer was awful because gay people don't drink beer. Well, clearly they do. Uh, that, <laughs> that's something that's getting better now. But um, the drinks were expensive. They were smoky. They were, ugh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, okay. I'm done with that now. Um, so that was the bar spiel, I guess. Am I forgetting anything? It's probably better if I let, let um, everything else go there. <laughs> um, I worked in, oh, yeah. That, okay. that probably is important, though. I did work in several bars as well uh, here in, uh, in Greensboro, particularly. I worked at a bar called Busby's that originally was on High Point Road uh, and later moved downtown to Commerce Place. Ooh, I didn't talk about Commerce Place either. Um, Busby's was interesting. He, was, he moved into uh, Greensboro from afar. He was actually a musician and ended up opening a bar as well that was designed to be sort of a man's bar if you will. Um, Not really a leather bar, just a very masculine focused bar, whatever that means. Uh, The original incarnation of that wasn't. It was in an old pizza joint. It was really hard to make it look all that butch, but um, I was a DJ there for a brief while. And, you know, I was playing my music that I was liking, which was not the music (laughs) that the audience was liking. Yeah. Picture me you know, in, in a gay bar in Greensboro, North Carolina, one night playing I Walk the Line by Johnny Cash. And people were ready to throw things at me. <laughs> um, I quit that gig because, very specifically, the owner of the bar, I had straight friends who came to see me mm-hmm. being the DJ. He had a problem with that. He didn't want these straight people, or particularly not demonstrably straight. And by demonstrably, I mean guy had his arm around a girl i'm like i'm thinking these are the kind of people that you should want coming into this bar Mm -hmm. Uh, i understand the whole safe spaces thing and the whole queer spaces thing etc but you know these are allies and these are the kind of people that you should be welcoming into the bar that's how you know we develop relationships with the rest of the world um this is going to be a running theme here, too, I think. But uh, I also worked at XTC, which was a bar on High Point Road. Um, both of these bars were interesting in that they were on High Point Road, which is now Gate City Boulevard. At that time, it was a big commercial corridor in Greensboro. And previously, gay bars had been sort of hidden. These bars were pretty open and out there right in the middle. And XTC you know, had a little marquee uh, sign on the front that actually advertised upcoming drag shows. So that was pretty out there for North Carolina in the late 80s. I worked there and was the door person. So I would check IDs and it was, the door person was very important in bars back then because North Carolina came to liquor by the drink late and you had to be a private club and there were all kinds of um, admission requirements people had to come up with to get into your bar if it served liquor. And they were 
how shall I say, enforced more stringently in some cases on gay bars that the state didn't necessarily like the existence of. So, you know, basically we had to play it by the letter of the law. Mm -hmm. So the door was kind of an important place to be at that time. Didn't like working in bars much more than I liked being in them because it was same music, same crowd. I was getting paid for it, but still. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't walk out when I wanted to either. So, um, so yeah, okay, worked in bars. Now, okay, that got the bar thing out of the way. Um, <laughs> well, this might bring up a little bit more. Um, <laughs> you mentioned working at a place that had drag shows, but did you have any other interactions with the drag community, I guess, in Dr Greensboro? Drag is a thing. I have I had several friends who were drag performers. Uh, Marilyn Rivers, particularly, who we actually have an oral history interview with here. Uh, Lily White from Atlanta. I was really into the funny, campy rock and roll drag queens. Mm -hmm. That was my thing. You know, the ones who would actually not just go out and lip sync to a Whitney Houston song or whatever, but would actually go out, get on microphone, tell jokes. Um, do really odd rock and roll and alternative music at the time. There weren't many drag queens <laughs> doing that around here at that point, but sort of, I don't know if you will, the kind of New York big city drag queen. I did not care much for the very serious drag thing, mm -hmm. you know, like the whole pageant scenario. Mm -hmm. Not because I was offended by it particularly. I wasn't offended by it. I don't, you know, I don't really have a I'll talk about gender roles later too, but I don't really have a whole problem with it. I was not offended by it at all. I just found it kind of boring mm -hmm. musically and performance wise. It's the same reason I sort of don't like 70s art rock and progressive rock because I tend to not like anything that takes itself way too seriously. Wow. And I felt like a lot of the drag scene at that time kind of took itself way too seriously. And it just wasn't fun. I didn't find it interesting at all. Um, I didn't find it offensive, and I was glad it was a thing that people go to. I just didn't enjoy it, you know, myself particularly. But I did have a lot of friends who were drag performers as well um, that did tend to be more on the, you know, the funny side or the, or, or the, or the fun side. Okay. Um, and drag, you know, is, is still now too, but was a really big part of the scene in the South. You, know, you went in bars in the South, even if they were dark leather bars, dance music and drag shows. Sunday nights, always drag shows everywhere. Um, but yeah, yeah, everybody had drag shows and everybody had dancing and that was part of why I didn't like bars here. But uh, <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, that's drag. <laughs> I could have said that's a drag, but that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, so, seems like a bit of a jump, but I didn't transition very well. So, I guess, <laughs> how did the the AIDS epidemic affect Greensboro? Because I know, because it was in the South, so it d it took a long longer time for it to become relevant. But did you see any of that effect? Well, that sort of actually, actually isn't as much of a transition as you think it is, because you know it's like when you have a culture that's that's uh, set in bars and a lot of ways. You know, there's also sort of a hookup aspect to it. Except there wasn't. I don't know. There wasn't for me anyway. Uh, <laughs> I spent the whole '80s, um, or I spent a large part of the '80s in North Carolina, sort of involuntarily celibate, but. Um, I think a lot of people did, and part of it was coming out when people, AIDS took a long time to be recognized here, you know, when they were talking about it in 81, 82, 83 in mm -hmm. bigger cities, we were talking about it, we sort of started the conversation, if you will, maybe late in 84, and it became a bigger thing here in like 85, 86, 87. Um, people weren't paying much attention to it before that. I mean, we knew about it, we heard about it, but it was not a thing we were thinking about until, you know, people started dying. Mm -hmm. Funny how that will impact um, the way you look at any pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, it did impact a lot of things. I think, you know, it uh, definitely, like it did everywhere in the country, it sort of cut into that whole hookup culture. It became harder to pick up people. Mm -hmm. uh, there were people that weren't having sex or that were only having sex with people they had known or 
were saying they only had sex with people who were saying they only had sex with uh, very few people. But um, it did affect things. But, you know, it had, as much as I don't like to say it, it had some positive aspects as well because it did bring bars, for example, back to a back to a place where they were more uh, an area of education for the community. You, know, you would find pamphlets from, say, the Triad Health Project and other groups. Uh, some bars, and this was really controversial at the time, bars, some bars actually had a bucket of condoms at the door. There were a lot of people that were really offended by that. And a lot of bars didn't do it. Um, I give points to Randall Busby at Busby's. I had some issues, you know, obviously with the bar when I was a DJ, but that was where the Triad Health Project was founded, was in his bar. And he was he was a very activist bent because he was one of the few actual gay owners of a gay bar in Greensboro. Uh, aside from there was a lesbian who managed the Palms, but I don't think she actually owned the bar. But he was one of the few gay owners of a gay bar, and he was very activist. And I think AIDS brought out a new level of activism that was a good thing for the community. Um, now, it was a bad thing that people were dying, but it was a good thing that it sort of pulled people together with a common cause and you know, made us realize that, you know, there are, there are things we need to fight about. And, you know, I think it pushed us to fight about other things as well. So it was a bad and awful thing. I did not know many people who here. I knew almost no one who had HIV. I had one friend who very suddenly died of it in about 1986 and no one had known that he had it beforehand. I didn't really start knowing people with HIV on a regular basis until I moved to San Francisco um, in the 90s, which was an interesting place to be in a whole, a whole separate story, which I'll tell you if you want at some <laughs> point too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it, it, it was it was an awful thing. I mean, we lost a larger part of a whole generation, less so here in the South. But again, it did sort of mobilize mobilize us as a group as well. So, okay. Um, well, San Francisco is uh, what my next next question about. Boy, I'm anticipating <laughs> these really well, huh? <laughs> yes. Um, I, I guess I'm more most interested in like how it was different and how living there might have impacted you when you moved back here. Oh wow! Um, I, I lived in San Francisco for 13 years. I enjoyed living in San Francisco for about eight of those years. Uh, the first eight were great. Um, you know, I moved there from, uh, I actually had friends from Charlotte who are uh, very close friends, both of whom I had sort of semi-dated at earlier points, who moved to San Francisco, they were, and they were childhood best friends. Yeah, that, that's a weird triangular thing. But, um, they moved to San Francisco about 1990, 1991, and I went out to visit. I had always thought maybe I'd move to California, but I always thought I'd end up in L.A. because, yeah, everybody thinks you'll end up in L.A. I thought San Francisco was nothing but old old people and old buildings, and I like old people and old buildings, but I wasn't sure if that was the environment I wanted to live in at the time. But I went to visit them in San Francisco, and I thought, wow, this is the most amazing place in the world, and I want to live here. Um, I was working at Kinko's at the time, and I was able to transfer to, to a store in San Francisco. So I was able to go out there already having a job, already having friends that I could move in with till I get set up in a place. And another good friend of mine had also just moved there, uh, who I knew from Winston-Salem, who I knew actually more from, who was also gay, but I also knew more from, you know, we'd see each other at music venue. We met at an REM show, actually. Um, uh, and ultimately, he became my roommate for like seven years when I moved to San Francisco. Um, when early on, it was like, it was amazing because San Francisco in the 90s was a, it had some similarities to San Francisco in the 70s, particularly because we were sort of just coming out of that AIDS coma and people were realizing that you could be sexual again. You just had to do it a little differently than you'd done it before. Mm -hmm. um, so there were interesting bars. There was an interesting culture. You know, that was that was the place where the whole queer punk thing was happening at the time, mm -hmm. which was really interesting to me. Um, you know, you went to you go to gay bars and they'd actually be playing music I liked. It was not all 
disco drivel crap. Um, but also there were there were sex clubs, you know, that were theoretically safe sex clubs. They weren't necessarily always as safe as they purported to be, but there were sex clubs, there were bars that had back rooms again, like sort of like in the 70s where people were actually sort of going out in the back room. It was a very sex positive culture, which a lot of people find a little icky and offensive at this point. You know, it was sort of, I think what I needed and what a lot of people needed at that point coming out of HIV AIDS, you know, it was actually, within certain circles, it was actually res not a respectable or not an unrespectable thing, not an embarrassing thing to say, I went to a sex club last night. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of, again, it was, it was sort of like Tales of the City, but with a darker grunge aspect and less of a preppy, <laughs> preppy clone aspect. It, it was a really great place. And I lived in South of Market in San Francisco, which was sort of right in the middle of the closing where all that was happening. Um, that was a time when you could move to San Francisco and work at Kinko's and afford to live there. And a lot of people did that. They worked at sort of marginal jobs because they were having interesting lives. Mm -hmm. Most of us grew up and moved past it. Some of us didn't. Some of us didn't live through it. There were a lot of drugs going around. Uh, we saw crystal meth a long time before the East Coast saw it. I was not doing that. I, I was I was past the drug thing completely at that point. I drank, I smoked, that was kind of it. Yes, I know I'm pretending that nicotine and alcohol are not <laughs> drugs, but let me go with this one for a little while. Um, at least they didn't involve needles, <laughs> you know? so um, which were a bad thing in the nineties. Um, but it was a really, it was a really great wide open place. It was a very inclusive place that you were starting to see, you know, men and women together in spaces more than they had been in the past. It was sort of a, a whole new openness that I really liked. Um, I really enjoyed being there, and you know, I am an urbanist at heart. Anyway, I like cities, um, and. San Francisco was the first case, I, the first time I actually had a real city to live in and explore. Uh, I had been an urban planning major before I moved to San Francisco, and you know, I actually theoretically moved to San Francisco with the idea that I was going to go to grad school at Berkeley and get my urban planning degree. That, that happened, um, but it gave me a city to explore, and I've, cities have been one of my primary fascinations with life ever since how they develop spatially urban history that's all i read pretty much is urban history and uh, retail history which is a whole separate area but um yeah it was great i loved living there it was a more open culture it was a place again that had enough of a critical mass of people that i could meet you know, gay people that I actually like and could stop kind of, if you will, seeing them as these sort of one-dimensional characters I knew from bars and wouldn't talk to in the daytime because mm -hmm. they were icky. <laughs> I met people, you know, that I hung out with in the daytime and went places with. And I actually, you know, I actually met it. It was the kind of place where you could actually have a variety of friends, gay, straight, and all the, all the infinite variations in between. Um... So it was, it, was, it, was, it was a really good thing for me for a few years. It got really tiring after a while. Uh, it got really expensive. Now, I was rent controlled, so I moved there in 1992 at the bottom of a recession. I had a rent controlled apartment that, that was like $800 a month when I moved in in 1992, which seemed like an astounding amount of money mm -hmm. at the time. But when I moved out in 2005, I was still only paying a little over 900. The day I moved out, the rent went up to 3,000. <laughs> pretty much um, so yeah I have feelings about rent control but I did benefit from them uh, and I did uh, you know in San Francisco was also where I moved into my second phase career-wise because I was living right down the street from where the internet was being born so I started building websites and that sort of got me here that's a long convoluted story that I think could be a whole other interview at some point. But um, I started building websites. I had a very popular, we used to, what was at the time called a blog. I, I, I hate the word blogs. It sounds like something you cough up when you have a bad cold. <laughs> but I had a very popular one in the 90s. Uh, I met a lot of people. I did several road trips around the country meeting people that I knew from the site. Um, I met my long-term partner 
by way of MR, who was somebody from Fresno. Uh, we got together in 2001, and we're together for almost 10 years. Um, in the middle of that time, in 2005, was when we moved back to North Carolina. Okay. Um, so let's see. I've done. I've gotten. I've gotten myself back from San Francisco now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, back from San Francisco, partnered and living in Winston Salem. Okay. Um, and that's you, not where I am anymore. No. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> did you move here for grad school or? No, we moved here for getting the hell out of San Francisco. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we both presumably wanted to, though we ended up being sort of a long distance thing because he was commuting back to San Francisco for about half his time over the next couple of years, which was a mistake. <laughs> um, it didn't end well. It lasted for 10 years, but it didn't end well. Um, I mean, we don't hate each other or anything, but it didn't end well. Um, but we moved to get out of San Francisco. We moved, my parents were getting older, and I wanted to you know, spend some time with them before it was too late. Cost of living was here. We wanted to own a house. Mm -hmm. We bought a house. It's too much of a house. <laughs> I ended up selling it, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we wanted, we, we wanted to we wanted to do the suburban thing, I guess, for a little while, um, which may have been something of a mistake because I do particularly still like urban environments, and I don't consider Greensboro to be an urban environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but the great thing about living here is that it's a low cost of living. I don't have a lot of expenses, and I can travel to all these places I like and spend time other places, and that's what I do now. I travel constantly, so. Um, yeah, that's why we moved back. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to ask this question first. Um, so, I guess post grad school, you became a faculty member pretty, pretty quickly. Pretty quickly, right? <laughs> um, how did being a faculty member change the way you interacted with, um, I guess, the LGBT community at the university? Initially, I don't think it had really much effect at all. You know, I was, you know, I, I guess I became one of the the handful of out librarians in Jackson, but um, it, it wasn't a really big shift for me at that point until you know a few years later when we started the Pride of the Community project, which was documenting LGBTQ history in Greensboro. Mm -hmm. uh, Originally, we were working with Jennifer Motsko, who was here uh, and is now in Wisconsin, and Stacy Krim, who is here in the room with us, uh, <laughs> and also works on the project, uh, and is, is, is actually more of a leader on the project than I am, uh, in a lot of ways, but, um, because it's something she'd been focusing on at UNCG for years and years, too, and it became kind of a big, it was originally going to be a big digitization project. We were going to have community scanning days, people were going to bring in their stuff, we were going to scan all their history. People didn't have that much history. It became more of an oral history focused project. There was some digitization as well. And I didn't make clear earlier, digitization is what I do here in the library. Um, I build digital collections. That's what I'm, that's my responsibility. So um, it became more of an oral history project, which is good because we've had kind of a wide cross-section of people. I mean, you know, at this point with me, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel, but We've in, we've interviewed a lot of really interesting people from a lot of different areas, and we would like to build even more diversity into that. If you're interested in doing an interview and you're listening to this, <laughs> let us know. We want to talk to you. Um, but that's the main the main the main way that it's uh, helped me interact with the community. I'm still I'm not I am a I fake it well. I can fake outgoing all day, but I am an extremely introverted person. I don't mix well. I'm socially awkward. Again, I can disguise it pretty well, but I'm not a joiner either, so I, you know, I'm not a hugely social person. I'm not spending a lot of time hanging out with friends or joining organizations, etc. That's just not me. Um, so, you know, I haven't been closely involved. I have been, you know, I've done activist things I could be reliably counted on to show up at demonstrations mm -hmm. and protests. Um, yeah, you know, I did some uh, some act up demos with in in 
one in Columbia, South Carolina in 1989, where we had a die-in. Those were fun. Uh, act up die-ins, where you would actually just lie down across the street and be dead in the crosswalk so traffic couldn't come by. Um, I was not one of the people who allowed myself to get arrested, though, because I had to go back to work. Um, uh, I was at the Cracker Barrel. The Cracker Barrel had a big uh, anti-discrimination. The restaurant chain had a big mm -hmm. anti-discrimination issue in the early '90s. Basically, they specifically had a policy that said we do not hire people who do not demonstrate. And this is the exact quote: "Normal heterosexual values." Um, so that became a big protest throughout the Southeast. There were huge protests in Atlanta. We had to sit in here once, too. They got news coverage. So, theoretically, I'm not ever supposed to go back to Cracker Barrel again, and I'm okay with that, really. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think Cracker Barrel has mended their, has since mended their ways. I have to give them credit for that, but I still don't want to eat there. <laughs> um, you know, I was involved in, I would go to things like that, the Greensboro City Council uh, in 19... 89, 90, I forget the year now, they actually um, passed a non-discrimination ordinance, one of the first in the state. It only applied to city employees. Um, there was a lot of controversy around that, and they did actually go back and reverse themselves a few weeks later, which was classy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was sort of you know at a lot of a lot of those meetings, et cetera. But not, I was not a foot sol an activist foot soldier in any way. I was, I could be reliably counted upon to show up mm -hmm. at things like this where needed. But yeah, you know, as far as being in the everyday activism thing, I wasn't doing that so much. Um, and you know, if I was doing activism in San Francisco, a lot of times I was more involved in things like anti gentrification <laughs> and that kind of stuff. But. Gotcha. Um, did you see, were there any, like, generational divides that you'd see more, more so today between older and younger, um, gay people, or I guess it could also have been yeah. earlier? I don't like to say divides so much. Okay. Um, it is different now. I mean, you know, from my generation, and you know, I'm, I guess you must you must implant me firmly in Gen X, even though I was born maybe a few months too early to be officially in that demographic. I have more in common with Gen X than I do with the baby boom, because yeah, you know, when I was born, you know, it's like I was the Brady Bunch generation. I was not the father knows best generation, for whatever that's worth. Um, but we were, you know, we were introduced and we're coming out of, you know, the original gay liberation movement, which was sort of, in a lot of ways, about, I don't know, it felt, there are those who would disagree. It felt very inclusive, though. It's like it was kind of a, a big tent thing. Um it was, yeah, and of course that was really a fantasy world that you know, mm -hmm. men and women and everybody were all going to work together, and there's never going to be any trouble, and la <laughs> la la, happy happy happy. But that was the goal at the time, anyway, and it was also very closely related to the women's movement at the time. Uh, that was when we still had a chance that the ERA might, the Equal Rights mm -hmm. Amendment, might get passed. We officially still do now, but it ain't going to happen. Um, and it was. The big thing I think about in retrospect now is that um, a lot of that was about gender roles specifically and sort of breaking down the idea of really strict, fluid gender roles. That was important for this generation, particularly you know, for me. I went to this awful, awful Southern Baptist elementary school where gender rules were really rigid. If you were a boy, you were going to play sports and do this and that mm -hmm. whatsoever. If you were a girl, you were going to do this stuff. Um, it was very much about kind of removing those gender roles and saying, if you're a boy and you don't want to do sports or you want to play with dolls or whatever, that's okay. Um, the difference I see between that and now is that in the gay movement, it's always been focused a lot on identity politics, and that's a problem I have with it. Because if you ask me how I identify, what I'm going to tell you is that I identify... As an urbanist, I identify as an armchair historian, I identify as a music geek, 
my sexual orientation, my gender identity is not at the top of the list for me. It's just another thing. Sort of like my hair color, sort of like the fact that I eat meat mm -hmm. and I eat vegetables. <laughs> Omnivore, yeah. Um, you know, and it's, it's not the top of the list for me. And I realize I'm coming from a little bit of a place of privilege here because, you know, I'm, I'm a white middle class guy. First and foremost, in America, that kind of trumps everything else, for better or worse. Okay, mostly for worse. Okay, entirely for worse. But, um, but still, you know, the sexual orientation and gender identity is not the thing that defines me. It would never be the first thing I would put, mm -hmm. say, in a social media profile or whatever. I feel that in a lot of ways now, people are... We were trying to get real labels, I think, and that was sort of the goal. And I think people focus more on labels now than I'm 100% comfortable with. I understand why it happens, and I'm, I don't criticize anybody for it happening, but I feel like the labels are a little too important at this point now, and people focus too much on them. And I don't think that's bad necessarily because people need to be what they are. I feel like it brings up a level of divisiveness within kind of the larger community or the larger group, which is why you see a lot of people you know, saying now, it's like the gay movement and the trans movement are not the same movement. Well, they kind of are, but in a, in a lot of ways, we, and not just from both sides of that, we've sort of divided ourselves into our two little bunkers and made it feel like two separate movements. And uh, we've moved away from a lot of the things that were related to the women's movement yeah and all in all i feel like things are so much better now um i would be so happy i would be so much happier coming out now than i was 40 years ago because you know, i feel like you can come and that was what we were all after at the time you can come out and it's not a big deal mm -hmm. you know you just say i'm attracted to men i am not attracted to men <laughs> you know it's a thing and I feel like, you know, am I talking myself into a hole here? I don't know. Um, I feel like, in a lot of ways, it's so much better. People, we don't have to segregate ourselves into these awful little gay bars that were not the right situation for a lot of people. Uh, it's open. There's a lot more support. Thank you, Internet, which pretty much changed everything for everybody but at the same time I feel like um, for a lot of people it must be harder now because instead of just doing it you have to sort of think about how you're how you're going to identify and present yourself and we all do that obviously mm -hmm. but um, I don't know I feel like we're focusing on more labels rather than fewer now and I don't know that that's necessarily the right way to go but that's my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I, this is sort of related. Uh, so, what is the role that like pride parades play in, in building or or maybe creating an exclusive community? If that makes sense. I feel like pride parades are important in a lot of places. I have been, I think, to three pride parades in my entire life. I went to one in Raleigh in 1988, which was one of the first big North Carolina pride parades. Uh, I felt like I really needed to be there because I, there was a visibility thing. There needed to be that visibility at that time. I went to two pride parades in San Francisco. I didn't get that same warm, fuzzy feeling from mm -hmm. them. Because in San Francisco, it was like, well, you know, we're already pretty damn visible here. Mm -hmm. And the Pride Parade is just a big party and a big commercialized party and a big excuse to sell absolute vodka. And I don't get the warm, squishy, maybe I'm being too political here, but I think the Pride Parade should be maybe about something more than a party. Or maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe we're past the point where we needed to be all about politics. Maybe it should just be a party, but I don't know. It was not an environment I was comfortable in. Part of that is me too. I don't like big crowds. I don't like big outdoor events. 
pride parades have big crowds and are big outdoor events. You know, it's the same reason I don't go to giant music festivals and places. I don't want to be in a big crowd outdoors, especially in the middle of the summer. Why would anyone want to do that? I don't do sunshine either because <laughs> <laughs> I don't do sunshine or heat. But um, I think pride parades are important, but I think uh, they're more important in places where they're needed for the visibility. Um, I think in some ways they can be not counterproductive, but I don't know what I mean. Um, I just didn't, f I sort of, and the ones in San Francisco, I just sort of said, oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> um, and the ones here I don't go to now because, oh, crowds, hot, summer, outdoors. Um, <laughs> just like I don't go to anything, crowds, summer, outdoors. <laughs> At least I don't discriminate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, does that cover that Yeah, it pretty does. well? Uh, and that was my last, like, uh, focused question. So I guess, is there anything else that yeah. we didn't yeah, touch? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, as long as it's not hard. Not. <laughs> okay. In your adventures at UNCG in Greensboro, did you ever interact with anyone in the trans community? At UNCG, no. At bars I worked at, yes. There were uh, one or two uh, performers when I worked at XTC who were actually trans, were in the process of transitioning, going through the whole uh, physical transition process. Uh, I did know a few people there, but uh, not a significant amount ever at UNCG at that point. Uh, in more recent years, you know, working with students, yes, I have met you know, far more trans people, and I think that's not surprising since you know it's a much more visible and open thing at this point than than it was in i'll say 1982 or 1989 when i was here the first time you know and we were still using terms like pre-op back then which is just kind of an icky term you know um hmm. other questions or thoughts i don't know i am I feel like, you know, um, I tend to, I feel like I kind of pontificate a little bit and, you know, I, I regret that and I'm sorry if it came across that way. I do, I am, I am a fairly opinionated person and sometimes my opinions don't necessarily, I, mean, I think I'm pretty, uh, I like to feel like I'm pretty open-minded toward everything and, uh, and I, frankly credit my parents for that because you know they were they were of their era largely very liberal and open-minded too despite the fact that they sent me to this god-awful school uh, they were actually very open-minded liberal and yeah you know, i'd come home and say you know what crap they taught me today and they'd say oh yeah well just sort of live with it and ignore it <laughs> um but um you know and i think you know having my I credit my parents a lot more as I get older. You know, they were they were stupid, didn't know anything when I was 20, 20 or so. But you know, now they now I realize. You know, for years and years, and I meant to mention this earlier. My mom and dad both worked, and in those days, it was a little more unusual for for women to work outside the home. And in fact, my mom worked. Uh, my dad was out of work a lot of times in the seventies because uh, the uh, plant he managed closed down, and he didn't have. A good long-term relationship. So a lot of time, for a lot of time, my mom was the breadwinner in the family, which is kind of why I'm attuned with uh, the whole. I don't like rigid gender roles as they were applied up to that point, and I'm afraid that we're sort of reapplying now. But actually, divorce, uh, we're sort of reapplying those gender roles now. Um, you know, whereas we were trying to say, you know, if you don't like sports or you don't want or you want to play with dolls, it's okay. Whereas now, I think a lot of people are thinking, well, if you don't like sports and you identify with things that are female, maybe, or that you enjoy things that are female, maybe you identify as female. And I don't think that's a, ch it's a hard choice to make for somebody. Um, you know, sorry, I have a lot of thoughts about gender roles. I could do a whole separate uh, interview on that too. <laughs> but, uh, but I think, you know, my parents were a big part of why I have that thought because my mom did work and she was actually our primary breadwinner for a long time so you know it was different from a lot of people the experience of a lot of people in my generation and i was kind of very proud of that fact you know my 
bless her heart, my mom was doing computer security in 1984 for the Internal Revenue Service. How cool was that? <laughs> and she was in her 50s at the time, so it was pretty much an old dog, new tricks kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, to kind of wrap up the interview, is there any message or words of advice you would like to give young LGBTQ people who may find this on the internet? Be who you are and express who you are very openly. Don't worry if it doesn't fit into a certain box or a certain label. Just do what you're going to do and don't stress over it maybe so much as my generation did, even the current generation does in a different way. You know, just be yourself, you know, it's, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how much more simply to put it, you know, it's like, you know, just, um, we're all individuals and we sort of, we are all part of a community as well, but we are also all individuals and we need to kind of let that shine through too in whatever way you do it then you know and i probably sound judgmental about some ways some people have done it over the years and for that i'm sorry yeah that's that's my weakness and my forthcoming and my grouchy old man thing but um but yeah just you know be who you are and live life and enjoy it because you don't get a second chance <laughs> all right thank you thank you